and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Cul-de-sacs and fault lines, there's no shortage of either in today's Ukraine. The government in Kiev appears to be losing its ability to rule, as international creditors grimly await the conditions of Ukraine's financial default. As rumored, is Washington now looking for a way out? To crosstalk the Ukrainian quagmire, I'm joined by my guest, Nabosha Malich in Washington. He's a foreign affairs columnist as well as a news writer for RT America. In New York, we have Patrick Smith. He is a foreign affairs columnist for Salon and a former foreign correspondent. And in London, we cross to Marcus Papadopoulos. He is the editor of Politics First magazine. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules. In fact, that means you can jump in anytime you want. Marcus, if I go to you first in London, I have a, a ledger I made up right before our recording here. And on one side of the ledger, I have the U.S. House of Representatives and I have Russian media like me here at Crosstalk. OK, on the other side of the ledger, we have the Obama administration, Victoria Newland. We have D.C. think tankers, academia, mass media. What do they disagree on? Well, can you guess? Go ahead. Well, well, I think um, I think they uh, I think they disagree fundamentally on uh, on Ukraine's future, and um, I wouldn't sort of play too much into it. So that the Americans are starting to lose uh, interest in Ukraine. There's been some talk uh, at the Senate that uh, the American government will no longer uh, finance uh, ultra-nationalist neo-Nazi groups operating in Ukraine. Well, I personally believe that happens to be a, a PR exercise because the American <laughs> government have been very clear about who have been operating in Ukraine for the last year and a half, as they've been very, very aware of uh, the neo-Nazis, uh, which have been operating in the Baltic states. So I believe that's more of a PR exercise. Can, can I jump and I in think here, it's Marcus? Ludicrous. Can, I, uh, can I jump in yes, here, Marcus? Sir, Patrick, go right ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it, go ahead. It, it, it it really does. It really does tell us something that uh, in 2015 somebody has to uh, produce an act of Congress saying we're no longer going to finance <laughs> neo-fascists. I mean, is that supposed to be generous? At least they admit they are there. That is progress, mm. huh? <laughs> Okay, Nebojša, what do you think about that? Because I would say that's that I would say that's progress as well. Yeah, but I mean, what's, in the scheme right, of I things, mean, go ahead, go ahead. In the scheme of things here, because it doesn't necessarily it's mean it's going to. Yeah, it's a, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Nebojša, go ahead. It's not going to amount to much, but um, as, as Marco said, it is PR. On the other hand, so much in Washington is, is just PR. PR that this could, uh, this is technically a tectonic yeah. shift that, you know, there was an act of Congress saying there are Nazis in Ukraine. For the past year and more, there, there's been a constant chorus of voices in the Western press saying no Nazis, no Nazis, there's been no Nazis, this is, you know, democratic reformers, this is a democratic democracy, and these evil Russian aggressors are saying that there are Nazis and they're inventing lies, and then you have an act of, and you have a, 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 a almost unanimous resolution in Congress saying, oh yeah, we're not funding Nazis anymore. Wait a second, that means you have been? That, that means an admission you have been? That, that means that admission wanna, that there have been Nazis? Paging Dr. Newland, paging Dr. <laughs> Newland. <laughs> Patrick, jump in. You want to jump in, Patrick? I would like to go back to Peter's. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, I do. I want to go back to your original question, Peter. What do they disagree on? Here's what they disagree on, in my view. They disagree on who is responsible for this crisis, and they disagree on any notion of historical causality. Uh, the, the Russian side here is very coherent on, uh, on, on the chronology and, let's say, the causality of this conflict, okay? The Americans, uh, they, here's one example of what I mean. Uh, we announced that we are putting uh, materiel and rotating troops in six uh, frontline countries, right? Uh, the Russian president uh, makes a remark about uh, new plan plans for new nuclear missiles. No one over on this side can, uh, can connect those two. It's just called loose rhetoric. Come off it. 
Uh, yeah. That's what they disagree on, responsibility. Okay. We must always keep that in I mind. I agree. Marcus, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that you, Patrick brought up the, uh, the whole issue of uh, more deployments, military deployments from the United States into NATO countries on Russia's border. But the thing is, is that I find really interesting is looking at con congressional uh, testimony, what's called academic media, which I, I, I'm very suspect of, and just the mainstream here. And it almost gets down to is that it's calling someone's bluff, calling Putin's bluff. But if you look at what the Russian side has said, and I'm echoing what Patrick had to say here, it's very coherent during this entire crisis that was invented, that was brought to Ukraine. And, 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 the, and the Russian side says, if you go over these lines, we will respond accordingly. And they've said it in a very calm way, that their national security is first and foremost. But I don't think anybody really gets that in Washington. Go ahead, Marcus. Peter. Well, I think you're right, Peter. Peter. Let me go to there's Marcus. Of, there, let me, go to, been, let me well, go, to, go to let me go to London first. Go ahead, Marcus, and we'll go to Patrick. Go ahead. Well, I think well, I think Peter, you're very right. There is a lot of bluff involved, but it's also very, very dangerous bluff as well. And I think the Americans have been looking for a pretext um, to take a very hard line stance with Russia for the last 20 years or so. And 20 years have been have involved Ukraine because the Americans have been seeking since 1991 to bring Ukraine. Ukraine into the West's orbit. And now that Ukraine has descended into chaos, of course, the Americans are going to blame Russia and they are going to cite Ukraine as a pretext to uh, redeploy their military forces in Eastern Europe and possibly to redeploy intermediate nuclear missiles in, uh, in Western Europe and also in Britain. So it's a very, very dangerous situation. And I'd just like to make it very clear once again that no one should be under an illusion that the Americans are starting to, quote, back off from Ukraine. Okay. Absolutely not. The Americans crossed over a red line in February 2014 when they instigated a Western-backed coup in Kiev. They have the advantage in Ukraine now. Yes, they're going to have to pay a lot of money to bring Ukraine into the West's orbit, but they believe that the return will be Ukraine in NATO, Ukraine in the European Union, and Russia encircled completely on its Western borders. Okay. I, there's a lot said Marcus. right there. We, we can make, we can make a whole week of programs yeah. on that. Patrick, go ahead. Respond. Go ahead. Uh, Marcus, I, I'm with you with, with one qualifier. What I am hearing from uh, sources in Europe and Washington is the following. Uh, wa the, the Obama administration is extremely disappointed with what is going on in Kiev. You have, you have popularity ratings of sort of 1.5, 3, 4% for these for these people. They are not performing. They, the corruption business is absolutely out of hand. They are passing laws with, quotation marks, zero implementation. Uh, and uh, Washington has probably concluded that it's a bust working with these people. But they are stuck. Uh, who else? Uh, I, I think you're quite right that uh, the Americans have no intention of backing off here. Uh, but Patrick, I, I could, could I just say ago, one thing, in the Patrick? End, they're going to walk back with their, yeah. Go ahead, Marcus, jump in, go and then I want, to go to, I want to go to Washington. Go ahead, Marcus, real quick, go ahead. If I, if I could say one thing, Patrick, yes, I hear what you say, but the Americans have never abandoned Kosovo. Kosovo, in terms of organized crime, is a black hole in Europe, and yet the Americans will not abandon Kosovo. I mean, they have one of the largest military bases yeah, in the we, world we in don't Kosovo, disagree. Camp Bonsteel. So, so, so they're, they're de I don't think they're going to, they won't drop Kosovo, and they won't drop Ukraine. They've been working on Ukraine for 20 years, and effectively, in my opinion, we, they have captured Ukraine. Yes, they're going to have to pay a large amount, but yeah, I, but I do hear what you're saying. Right, I want to jump in here. Naboshi, you want, you, you've been listening patiently. Weigh in, my friend. Go ahead. Well, uh, they won't drop either of these constructs. I wouldn't call them countries at this stage, but they will, can and will drop leadership. I wouldn't be yeah. the least bit surprised if President Poroshenko uh, was either, you know, overthrown, discharged, impeached, or even assassinated. I mean, there's a rich history of Americans disposing of their allies when they were no longer useful. Um, if the One analysis that this. we've heard One is correct, this. and I believe it is, then the problem, the problem uh, with Kiev is that uh, it's not that they're Nazis or that they're instating 
a war with Russia, it's that they're very bad at it, that they're <laughs> failing at it. So yeah. Washington is going to move <laughs> ahead and find somebody who will be better at it, not understanding. And this is my second point that I really wanted to make, that the, things are not working the way they imagine them to work. This is not just a cause, a case of uh, causality gone horribly wrong, but a massive, massive failure to communicate. People in Washington simply can't understand anybody else's perspective because yeah. they've been living in their own echo chamber for so long that they just can't, cannot process outside input anymore. Patrick, you know, it's groupthink. It's, this Excellent is what it's gotten point. down. Yes, absolutely. You want to elaborate yeah. on that, Patrick? Go ahead. Well, uh, at this point, we are, uh, and because of the absence of, of uh, causal reasoning, okay, we are really entering into a, a phase, so far as I, I was thinking about it this morning as I walked over to the studio, it's becoming completely irrational. Uh, when you have the Americans saying uh, uh, Russian aggression, Russian aggression, Russian aggression, and uh, leaving out, first of all, it is not aggression, it, 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 and, and leaving out any idea of why the, uh, Russia may be behaving as it is, uh, it it you, it, defi it it eliminates logical yeah. conversation. I feel rather badly yeah. for the Russian side in this. Yeah. There, there's nobody to talk to. Yep. Uh, I'd like to make one other point about about the the Russian position on this. I don't care how un unfashionable it is. Uh, President Putin has been, uh, for my money. One of the calmer voices in this, I'll put Chancellor Merkel in the same file, but he has been one of the more responsible people. If you follow the line of his reasoning, uh, his speeches, his occasional statements, uh, I credit him. I don't give a damn what anybody on this side of the ocean thinks of what I just said. Okay, I Pat, stand by it. I, I stand by those words as well. We're going to go to a short break, gents, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on Ukraine. Stay with our team. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lovell. To remind you, we're discussing the political and economic quagmire in Ukraine. Okay, Marcus, I'd like to go back to you in London. I just came back from St. Petersburg, the economic forum that they have every single year, and I hosted a panel on the new BRICS Development Bank. And I asked the uh, presumptive uh, 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 new president what he would do differently than Western institutions like the IMF. And he told me we would follow the rules because the IMF breaks its own rules, particularly right now, or at least it seems to be on the path to, where it will fund a, a, a war that it should not be doing. It will continue funding, even if it defaults on its public debt and private debt, it will continue funding, which is against every single rule of the IMF. But there's nothing to stop the IMF from doing that. This is, again, going back to some of the things we've said earlier in this program about, you know, the sense of causality and direction of this thing here. Again, you break all the rules, you overthrow democratically elected governments, and then you break your own uh, financial institution rules. Go ahead, Marcus. Well, I think that development, potential development on behalf of the BRICS, um, it sounds very promising. What we need is a new uh, monetary organization in the world which abides by the rules and also is ethical. The IMF is one of the most formidable weapons at Washington's disposal and they have caused uh, havoc, absolute well destruction said. around the world uh, in regard to the former Yugoslavia. Uh, one of the major reasons why the former Yugoslavia descended into civil war was because of the, uh, was because of the IMF loans. Look what happened to to Russia during the 1990s under the deplorable leadership of Boris Yeltsin, Russia was, was, on, was on an IMF uh, lifeline, um, which was absolutely uh, despicable. Um, so yes, we do need a new uh, financial organization in the world. However, the Americans uh, will uh, very, very seriously um, uh, oppose that because they know that any challenge to the IMF ultimately yeah. is a challenge to American global hegemony. They won't like it, um, but we can only be hopeful. And the 
world will be somewhat of a better place with such a new organization to oppose the dreadful IMF. Okay. Patrick, you know, all through this program here, we, we all have similar points of view. Do you know that there are people that say that we're just mimicking and echoing propaganda? How do you react to that? Because there are, there are regulators out there that say that's exactly what we do on this program. And um, I didn't brief anyone to come on this program here. You're speaking your mind, but people will still make that claim. How would you react right. to them? Go ahead. I would say our failure, Peter, is that we are not mimicking propaganda. That's our failure, right? Uh, uh, the, 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 the press over here, uh, one reason I am sitting here, the, the press over here has just absolutely collapsed yeah. in terms of its relationship, its, its, uh, its, its servitude, let's say. I don't think the word is too strong anymore. I would have at one point. It's not now. Uh, they, are, they are craven. It's a disgrace. Uh, uh, we are having this conversation, uh, impossible to have in the American media. Yeah, yeah. I don't, ha I don't want to put, uh, uh, I don't want to suggest that uh, propaganda is an American invention. We just happen to indulge in a very great deal of it and we're extremely powerful, those two things in combination. Yeah. And we are way over the top on, on this question, right? Okay, yeah. In, in, uh, let me go to Nebosha. We have more need of it, let's say, than the... Yeah, okay, Nebosha, yeah. let, me go, let me go to you in Washington here. We, we have the Defense Secretary traveling through Europe right now and just demanding everybody in the NATO alliance to pay their fair share. Almost nobody wants to. I think Greece is one of the... Believe it or not, Greece is one of the only countries <laughs> doing it. I find that astounding here. And, you know, if you look at the, the, <laughs> the most recent Pew Global Research um, uh, polls, I mean, most members of NATO don't really want to go to the aid of another NATO member vis-a-vis um, -vis Russia because a lot of people see through a lot of the propaganda, okay? I mean, this is one of the things that's very interesting here. I mean, you're in D.C. I'm out, out, outside of this bubble that you guys are bombarded with all of the time. I mean, how, how did they, you know, square the circle oh. there right there? I mean, if you just look at the data, I mean, I'm not particularly happy to see Germany rearm, okay? Just for historical reasons, okay? Go ahead. <laughs> Well, there's, there's again, two dynamics here at play. One is that if you look at the list of top ten weapons manufacturers in the world, you'll okay. find that m most of them are American companies, and this whole call for, you know, more money for defense is basically more corporate welfare for American weapon makers, yeah. in a nutshell. Yeah. But the other thing is that um, we mentioned the BRICS Bank and the IMF. Uh, the mainstream uh, political discourse in this town is essentially uh, going back to the whole uh, denial of causality. Uh, they're calling Russia and China and BRICS in general revisionist powers, and they're trying to <laughs> tap into the the whole interpretation of World War II as in, oh, there are these evil empires rising to to disturb the world order. I'm sorry, but if if you yourself are breaking the rules that you yourself have adopted and passed and in instigated, you are the revisionist power, exactly. and the people you're confronting, in this case Russia, China, BRICS, are the people trying to restore order. So really, who's the disruptive influence here, and who's the one uh, uh, trying to can, bring things into can balance? I can, 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 can I just I add to something ask the to that? Are we the bad guys? No, that's really, Mark, let me go back to London here. This is one of the interesting things, is because as the, the, these emerging powers emerge, by definition here, the West sees now, particularly the United States, is it's, there may, it might be held accountable for what it does in the world. And that scares the heck out of those people, because, you know, somebody must pay for the a quote-unquote annexation of Crimea when the people of Crimea exercise self-determination. But who punishes Washington for the illegal invasion of Iraq in 2003? Nobody. But that day is coming. Go ahead. And I think it's extremely I important for people. Uh, I think it's extremely important for people watching this program to understand that while the uh, while the West, led by America, is accusing Russia of redrawing the uh, the cold the, the post Cold War map of Europe, the reality is that it's the West that has done that. Who recognised the independence of Slovenia, Croatia, yep. and Bosnia, which destroyed the sanctity of internationally recognised borders? They destroyed Yugoslavia. That was the first. That 
was the first area Thank where you. they redrew the post post Cold War map of Europe. They then did again with Kosovo. They tore an integral part of Serbia away from a UN member whose borders are internationally recognized by all UN members in the world, and they proclaimed Kosovo as an independent country. No, Russia has not redrawn the post Cold War map of Europe. It is the West that has done that, led by America. That is the truth. Okay, pa Patrick. Can I add something? Go ahead. To what Marcus says. Just jump yeah. in. That's the point of the program. Go ahead. Uh, I, th this uh, this may come over a little oddly, but uh, we are talking about messes. We are talking about crises. We are talking about the prevalence of American power. In my view, taking the taking uh, the long perspective, I think things are actually going in the right direction. Hmm. I, I I think Washington's time. Uh, is gradually, messily uh, passing into the past. It will be one nation among others. I think that's what the entire rest of the planet is telling us. Uh, and I think uh, we, we must never lose sight of, uh, of, of what I, in what I view, the positive direction of events, right? I, 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 I see you. I, yeah, I, I, I do see. hold to that. I see. You know, now, Boyce, the, the, I, the Patrick has an interesting point here because over the last couple of years on this program, looking at these crises in the Middle East and now Ukraine, I always get the impression that in the halls of power, particularly in Washington, that people are in a hurry. They need to tie up all these loose ends because Russia, China, the BRICS, they're marching, revisionist or not, and these are, they're marching in, in the right direction, I would say. And I think that really scares Washington. And they Peter, prefer you... they prefer that they prefer this chaos around them because chaos works to their advantage, not to the people on the ground. The boy should in Washington. Go ahead. Well, as Pepe Escobar uh, is fond of saying, this is the empire yeah. of chaos. It thrives yeah. on chaos. It uses chaos. It abhors order. It, 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 it is afraid of order, uh, especially the order it, it itself created. How dare anybody else tell the Americans to obey the law? They are the law. And there's a definite whiff of desperation in Washington, um, I would say, b based on the, fa the sheer yeah. inability of Good the word. U.S. To impose its will elsewhere, it can break things, it can kill a lot of people, but it can't force the world to do its bidding anymore, and that's got, oh, that's got a lot of people in this town really you, scared. You, okay, you, Patrick, you want to jump in there? Go you ahead. You used a great word. You, you, yeah, you just used a great word. It's a position of desperation, and ultimately, such positions are not sustainable. Okay. Uh, once again, we are we are in a in a dreadful mess. But uh, I, I just urge. Uh, those in this conversation and also viewers to to consider the longer view here yeah, and not I, uh, I agree you know you know I agree with that but Marcus I'll go back to you because this program across talk we do a lot on Ukraine because this country where I live borders Ukraine people that I work with at this television station have relatives in Ukraine in the Donbass and it's very emotional it's very mm. very real what's happening to those people there. Do you see, because it yes. looks to me, and I'm going to back to Marcus here in, in, in London, I'm very worried that uh, uh, Poroshenko's usefulness is very limited, particularly for people like Victoria Newland. They will force him into another conflict that could even embroil more, not just the Donbass, but more of the country. I worry about that. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. The Ukrainian government is made up of, uh, of numerous elements, and in my opinion, those elements, they are all despicable. But I think the least of the, uh, of the evil in, in the Ukrainian government, it is Petro Poroshenko. I think he's probably the only person in Kiev uh, that President Putin and the rest of the Russian government can actually talk to. And I do wonder if his time is limited and if, he is, uh, if he's replaced, if he's overthrown, we could have someone possibly uh, connected to the right sector who could come to power and who would uh, yeah. instigate a full-blown invasion of the Donbass. And in fact, right sector are putting pressure Marcus, I'm not on Poroshenko to discard, I'm not with to, 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 to ignore Minsk too, to ignore Minsk too, and to actually uh, in, invade uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. So I'm no fan of Petro Poroshenko. He's got blood on his hands, but I think he's the only person the Russian government can actually talk to at the moment in Kiev. Okay, Patrick, 10 they, seconds, 10 they, seconds, real Marcus, quick. The, Go ahead, 10 the, seconds. 
they can talk to him only when he, they can talk to him only when the Americans or the Germans order him to talk to somebody. Otherwise, he won't talk to anybody. He's an All incompetent. Right. All right, gentlemen, maker. we will uh, revisit Ukraine over and over again as long as this crisis lasts. Many thanks to my guests in Washington, New York, and in London, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, cross talk rules. I love you. I love you.